Hello, everyone, and welcome to our fourth SCAD Gaming Fest. I'm SCAD Chair of Motion Media Design, Kelly Carlton. Today, we're going to be talking about the latest and cutting edge technology, virtual production. The benefits of virtual production are game changing and very revolutionary. We're talking about the combination of live talent with a versatile real time virtual stage, which really bridges the gap between traditional filmmaking, visual effects, and post-production processes by merging this technology in camera during the live production shoot. With us today are real-time technology innovators, Meptic, specializing in extended and augmented reality for virtual events, experiential design, and content creation. Meptic works to push the boundaries of innovative technology and design every day in the, in the projects that they uh, uh, endeavors that they pursue. Please join me in welcoming co-founder of Meptic, Nick Ribeiro. Hello, Nick. Hey, Kelly. Thank you for having me here today. Well, I am really excited today to get to speak to all of you about this incredibly exciting new frontier of XR and virtual production. And this is something we have seen just throughout all the media we're watching, everything we're experiencing just in the past 12 months, but in the past two years, really, this is completely blown up. And I'm excited to share and talk a bit about what it is, what it looks like, where we've seen it, and a bit of the workflow and what goes into it from a high level today. So I really wanna share with you the work we've been doing and the technology we've been developing in this workflow um, that is just incredibly exciting. The big one that I think we've all heard about, we've all seen at this point is the Mandalorian. And about 18 months ago, the Mandalorian really changed the game for standardizing what this technology is, standardizing the nomenclature, the use, the potential, the future momentum. This was really brought to light when Star Wars ILM put this technology front and center to develop the show The Mandalorian, but a cutting edge workflow that had never been seen before. Outside of that, just in the past 12 months, we've seen this go everywhere. We've seen things like this, musical performance completely uh, just dynamic. We now have things like this, Billie Eilish performing completely immersive concerts where the content becomes not just the backdrop to what we're doing, but it becomes the entire uh, vehicle of storytelling at this point. We've seen things like the MTV VMAs go from a live room and a live performance to creating a completely new and dynamic world on a virtual stage using these technologies. We've even seen things in corporate spaces like Snap doing standard traditional keynotes and speeches and things of that nature, but in completely new and different dynamic ways like you see here, getting rid of boring old backdrops and creating something completely innovative to accompany their brand. One of the most unique uses we've seen for a few years now is the Weather Channel. And they took the technology to really do something that what we hadn't seen before, which is make the weather really interesting. They were able to use the technology to tell new stories about the potential of the weather around you. What happens? What does it look like? What are the consequences of it? And it has become a main staple of telling these stories like you see here about rising water levels, things of that nature. We've even seen people this year like Verizon take a traditional keynote presentation and turn that into an immersive dynamic uh, new way to tell a story. And so as you can see the dynamic and the broad reach of this technology is not just in TV shows we're watching but we're seeing it everywhere. And that is only going to keep up and we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. But to start, we have to look at this key thing, which is why is all of this important in the first place? Well, I think it comes down to one key thing here, and it's this, the future is virtual. Everything we do from this point on will be based around this technology. It will be ingrained in the workflows, in the technology, in the productions from here on out. And it is really shown through cases like The Mandalorian just how game-changing this technology is to rewrite the entire course of history for what is now possible in these workflows. But beyond that, we know something even more is that creating engaging visual experiences is 
everything about what we are doing in this day and age. Why? Because the future is content, but it's not actually the future. The future is already content. We're already there. And everything we do is about content production in some way, shape, or form. And what these tools are allowing us to do is shape an entirely new set of possibilities for what is achievable, creating new engaging experiences that have never been seen, that have never been experienced before, are now becoming completely normalized in productions and workflows that have never seen this before. But beyond that, we actually know that the numbers are telling us how important this is. One of those key things is that 80% of executives in major companies around the world believe in these types of technologies. Why is that important? Well, these are the people that are hiring these types of productions. These are the concert artists that are investing in this. These are the people that are wanting to deploy this technology in the world. And 80% of that market believes that these things are important. But furthermore, we even have more telling numbers that in just another year, the entire virtual XR market will be $209 billion. In just three more years, they expect that to be $375 billion. And, and I just want to put that in perspective by telling you this, that two years ago, the NFL was only worth about $15 billion and Disney at only about $70 billion. So I show you this to say that this market is growing immensely and rapidly before our own eyes. But we need to go back to start with this question fundamentally is what is virtual? We hear the word virtual so many different times. We hear it in so many different use cases, but we need to start back at the beginning of what I call the three R's of virtual. And the first one is VR. And we've heard about this for a long time. We've seen it, we know what it is. It's this idea of wearing a headset to experience a virtual world. So you actually have to be immersed in goggles or something that basically is a singular experience that allows you to dive into a virtual world. The second one that has become a lot more commonplace is the idea of AR, is where we actually start doing a little bit of the inverse, is we take the virtual out of the headset and we start overlaying it into the actual world. We see this in things like Instagram filters, Snap filters. We see this in the famous game Pokemon Go, where they actually were able to take the digital world and through things like a phone, put that back in. But when now we have a third R, and this R is called mixed reality or extended reality. More people now really call it XR, but the idea is really interchangeable. And this is the idea that we now take the digital, we take the virtual, and we actually merge those into creating entirely new experiences like what you just saw. And so as you can already guess, this is where we're gonna focus our time is on the idea of XR, but XR is built on these other R's, is VR was really paramount to getting the idea of virtual immersive experiences to become a thing. AR really took it a step further by saying, well, we can now integrate that with real life. But beyond that, we now have XR where we're actually saying, what if we could create new experiences, new things that people are able to step into, and that is what we're gonna focus on. So I think we start here, which is the workflow behind all of this. And I think the best place to start is just what we've seen is this was a key piece that came out last May. It was on American Idol and it's Katy Perry basically performing an immersive experience. And this is XR at its core is being able to put somebody in a space that otherwise can't exist, doesn't exist, hasn't existed is not necessarily realistic. This is the core idea of it, is building an entirely new type and dynamic experience here. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about what is the technology and what is actually happening here, but this is the overarching idea, is creating this new type of experience. I wanna start by looking at the two kind of key ways this technology is used. So the first one, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this too, is the idea of green screen. So we've heard about green screens before. The most, I think, uh, known place we see them is on weather forecast. People stand in front of a green screen and we composite virtual content together with them and the audience sees this combined frame and they see both things happening. And what does that look like? Well, something like this. Here we have David standing on a very basic green screen. And we did this test quite some time ago and put that little green screen up in our office. But what are we actually doing is, well, 
We're using the green screen to key him out, to cut him out and put him into an immersive space. So green has been around for a very long time. It's still a very useful technology. And we're gonna touch a little bit more on the uses of it, but as you can see the idea really simply is using green screen to put someone in a virtual space. And those virtual spaces can be anything. We can put David in a fitness experience on that same green screen. We can put him in more of a musical concert experience also on that same green screen. So it allows a very high dynamic with a technology we're already used to. But what we've seen on The Mandalorian, and we will cover more in depth, is this, which is the idea of using LED, using screens to replace the green screen and actually build that same new experience. And the way that looks is something like this. So as you can see here, David is in one of our offices. He steps onto what is an actual screen. And as you can see, when he steps into that screen, reality goes away. But as you can see here, Around him, he's surrounded by an immersive experience, but behind him, he also has that same experience. So as you see the world fade away here, he's now steps off and you can see that piece of the world existing there. Another example is this one in the same space is completely different dynamic of what's possible with the same screen. So as Aaron steps in, the entire world goes away. And one thing you notice is that the content is actually behind her, but also like AR, it is in front of her. And that is something we call front plate and back plate, which we'll touch on in a little bit. But with that, let's actually go in and break down what makes up this workflow. I want to share a little bit of the overarching for those that aren't aware of what goes into the pieces that make up this XR puzzle. Well, it really looks like this. Five different pieces, content, engine, camera, tracking, and display. And let's look at it maybe in a more visual way like this. So the first key piece of the technology is the idea of content. You can't have this entire experience, this entire visual uh, canvas without the idea of content. And that is still really the biggest key to what you're doing with this. Outside of content, we have the engine. We actually have to drive all of this in real time. And that is a huge piece of this workflow. It is real time, much like video games. We have to run everything live on the fly, and we use different hardware and different software to do that. But predominantly, we have to build the content and then load that into an engine, into a platform that actually handles all of this um, extended reality technology. Beyond that, we have the camera, right? We have to capture the world. That is a key piece, is actually seeing the talent, as you saw David, either on the green screen or in front of that LED screen, we have to capture that. We have to bring that in and then be able to process that basically to make this experience. We do that with this fourth key piece, fourth key piece called tracking. So we'll talk a little bit more, but the idea of tracking is to actually analyze data from the camera, analyze where the camera is, analyze its focus and also its zoom data and bring all of that in to the immersive experience. And then the fifth piece is the display. And we kind of encapsulate in our world the display around either the idea of using green screen or using this LED technology. But in either um, one of these, we have these same five pieces. They will always be there no matter what the end result ends up being, whether we're working in a green screen or whether we're working in an LED environment or volume. So let's talk about the first one, which is content. To build this content, we are working in three key tools, Unreal, Unity, and Notch. These are all things I'm sure most of you are familiar with, especially with things like the Mandalorian being built completely in Unreal. These are really the, the trinity of the tools that are laying the way for these experiences, is we have to build everything in these worlds, uh, in these tools dynamically to actually render and happen live on the fly. They all have different pros and cons, really, but I can tell you in our workflow, we use all three pretty interchangeably, depending on really what the needs and the outcome we're trying to achieve is. The tools we're all used to, things like Maya, Cinema 4D, Blender, Houdini, those are all paramount to the workflow. And those actually really are used daily in our workflows to build into these other three, Unreal, Unity, and Notch, is we build things like primitive 3D geometry, we do things like texturing, 
materials. We can build a lot of that and then bring those over, but we don't actually bake or render anything really out of these workflows. We use them more in a sense of like modeling, constructing, sometimes animating 3D geometry, but we do a lot of work in these tools in conjunction with all of the other tools. And fundamentally, what is it that we're building? Well, the idea is worlds. We're building entire environments. You know, you've probably seen things like this or even very photorealistic worlds. We can build things that are completely unrealistic, like this vaporwave scene, or we can build things that have more of this industrial interior type of feel. But whatever the, the theme is, the core is this, is that we are building an environment. We're building a world to place people into because XR goes back into blending the digital and the physical. And sometimes those worlds can be very realistic and there's reason for that and purpose. And sometimes those worlds can be very creative like you saw in the Katy Perry piece, the VMAs, Billie Eilish. It really depends on the purpose of what we are trying to achieve. And we'll touch on some of those workflows here in a minute. The second key piece is what I said is the engine. And one of the key things about the engine I'll preface is this, is we have to separate out what we call the front plate and the back plate. So we separate out what happens behind you and we separate out what happens in front of you and we traditionally render that on different boxes entirely. And then we composite that together live on the fly to look something like this. So here you have Jordan standing in a warehouse. Behind her is an LED screen with a scene built in Unreal. And in front of her is a plain AR, our front plate, that is basically being rendered and created in notch and composited on top to give us one complete scene. So we have a world around her, but we have these dynamic elements we call front plate. But touching on that, what is the actual engine behind it? Well, it really varies. We use different boxes, different systems, like you can see here in the right, depending on the project. Sometimes we use machines that look like this with a mess of cable to achieve our workflows. But I can tell you for us, we use three tools predominantly, and that is Unreal. And Unreal, what we traditionally call is vanilla Unreal, kind of plain Unreal, is we can actually create these environments. We can create the content in Unreal, but we can actually deploy, we can make Unreal the engine. We use that sometimes. We also use a tool called Pixitope. And Pixitope is used very heavily in the broadcast AR green screen type of workflow. And we use it quite a bit to do exactly that, do green screen shoots in combination with Unreal. Um, and then we use Disguise, which is predominantly for LED types of workflows. So things like you see on The Mandalorian, things like you see with Katy Perry, MTV, that is all run in the Disguise platform. And we really use these all pretty interchangeably, but these are the engines. These are the back end that allow us to run our content and then deploy that content. And the reason we use these engines is because they afford us different types of tools that are bespoke to this workflow. So when you do things natively in vanilla Unreal, there's a lot of tools that don't traditionally exist in that in just vanilla Unreal. And so we're able to augment and offset that using things like Pixitope, which adds additional workflow tools such as green screen keying, a chroma keyer. They've built an entire um, proprietary system for that in their tools. And so we'll use that really depending on what our outcome is. But the goal is this, is that we analyze one, what is the type of workflow we're doing, whether it's green screen or LED. And then we work backwards to say, well, what is the better system that we need to be using? So as a team, we try to be proficient in all of these content workflows and all of these um, engine workflows. The next one I'll kind of compartmentalize together, which is camera and tracking. And this is really what I would say is the core, is the heart of how this technology works. And so what we have is this, which is a real camera. And those cameras can be pretty much anything, whether it's a cinema camera like a Sony Venice or an Arri Alexa to broadcast television types of cameras to more traditional consumer prosumer cameras. It can really be anything. But as I mentioned earlier, at the core of the technology, we have to have a real camera. But what we're actually trying to do is not just capture the person we're actually trying to do this, which is match the real camera in the real world, really one-to-one -one with a virtual camera. And the way we do that is through camera tracking systems. 
And what those systems do is they find the camera in the real world and they match it perfectly to the virtual camera in our engine. And what happens is when you move the camera in physical space, when you zoom in, you zoom out, you change your focus, we receive all of that data. And what we actually do is we apply all that data back to the virtual scene, say in Unreal. So when the camera moves left, the virtual camera moves the exact same amount of space left, basically allowing us to then marry the virtual and the physical world together. So what do these systems actually look like? Well, there's a couple different ones and they look like little things like this that sit on top of cameras. And this is one called Mosis. And Mosis has this little box, you can see the red to the left and they call it a star tracker. And why do they call it a star tracker? Well, it looks for things in the air that we typically call a constellation. And these little dots you see everywhere are different versions of these, but they are actually, um, infrared tape. So it's basically a very silver reflective tape, kind of what you would see on like a, a safety vest or something of that nature. But we put these little stars on the ceiling. Sometimes we put them on the floor. And basically what the system does is it memorizes where all of these stars exist in the room. And it allows the camera to figure out where it is. So we basically put these up, we cover the entire space that the camera needs to move. So anywhere upstage, downstage, left, right, we put this constellation. And then the camera, once it has its constellation, can move freely inside of that. We also use a different system called InCam. And InCam is really exciting because it doesn't use a constellation, doesn't use markers. So this is um, one of our cameras here in our office set up with InCam. And if you look over the left, you see there's a little camera bar on top of the camera lens. And what that does is it actually analyzes the room and uses AI to basically figure out very, very precisely where the camera is. And so the way we look at it is we use different technologies again for the right scenario. And some places InCam works really great for and other places Mosis works really great as well. And there's even, whole plethora of other systems called OptiTrack or Stipe. And we really use each of those depending on what we're doing, but they all share the same purpose, which is marrying the camera into the virtual world. So what does this actually look like when it's running? Well, here's an example of a very early music video we did many years ago. And what you can see here is an LED screen behind the artist, Lauren. And as the camera moves, you can dynamically see that window behind them updating. And that little window is something we call a frustrum. And as you can see here, it's kind of dark. There's a jib, so a camera on a big crane that is basically moving around. And as you see it move, you can actually see that window changing size. So right now the camera is zooming in and the camera will zoom back out here in a second. And as it moves and zooms and focuses, we render the content live to exactly what the camera is seeing in that point. So you notice there's a lot of black happening around it. Well, that's fine because we are only concerned with what the camera is actually seeing in that place and time. Here's a little bit different example of that showing you. So you can see standing right behind the camera what happens as the camera moves left, right, that window is following just what the camera needs to see at that point in time. And that's, again, the key to it. Part the part of it is the camera. The second part of it is the tracking. And there's actually a lot of complication in these systems in making them work really well. And it's really more than I even have time to go into, but there's a really complicated thing called lens distortion. And very simply put, is not only do we need to figure out where the camera is in space, we actually have to figure out how the lens distorts the real world. And if you ever look, say, through a water bottle, you can see how the image gets all distorted and weird. Well, cameras do the same thing when they see the world. What happens is they actually kind of undistort the image. Well, we have to do the same thing in the virtual world. So we actually have to understand how is the camera distorting the world. We basically capture that value and then we actually apply that value back to the virtual content. And when that is precise, when the lens distortion is correct and when the um, tracking is correct, you see what you see here. So you see how we're, the camera's moving around and things are sitting in perfect place and you see these blue cones that we're zooming in on. That cone is staying perfectly anchored in the right place. Those right lines are all staying in the right place. And that's exactly what we want is precision. We want these things to stay where they are as precisely as possible. And that's what these systems are doing.
You're also familiar with things like Vive trackers, and those things work, but the difference here is they don't share the same level of precision. And in these types of workflows, we need the utmost precision down to really even submillimeter to get these things dialed in really, really accurately. And that's just something that things like the Vive tracker system just doesn't offer is this level of precision. So our last key piece of this is display. And as I mentioned, there are these two halves of the virtual workflow. And why I bring them up is because we really see it as an encompassing umbrella that virtual is not just one or the other. It's the entire pipeline. And the same pipeline applies to both, whether you're going into green screen or you're going into LED. It is the exact same pipeline to get there. You just make changes really on the engine level some of the content level, but mostly on the engine and then on the deployment level, whether you have a large LED screen or a green screen. So what do these workflows look like? You know, when we put all the pieces together, when we put the camera, tracking, the green screen, et cetera, well, here's an example of what green screen looks like. So here's me and a friend of mine, Luke, standing on a 30 foot green screen. And this was a live event that we did uh, a couple months ago. And what you can see here is the camera is actually attached to a crane. And on that crane is this, which is this exact camera. And we're using our in-cam system. So you can see there's a computer. And then the top of the camera, we have this tracking bar attached to it. And we're able to move the camera freely and figure out where in space this camera is. And through all this data, we go back to our green screen. And live on the fly, we can actually composite all of this together to create what the audience actually sees, which is this. So live on broadcast, people are seeing this finished piece. Luke and I stand not on a green screen, but in an entirely immersive world. Giving you another glimpse, this is what some of the show looked like. So actually having a real host, here he is standing on the green screen, talking to the camera, talking to the camera live. So this was all a live stream happening. But as you can see on the right, you can see what is actually being composited together using content from Unreal and using Pixitope uh, to put the whole piece together. A different use case of green screen was this. We were able to do about a year ago, um, International Yoga Day with Lululemon. So we had Matt here in a green screen space, but this is obviously not what the audience saw. This is what they saw. And so it was a really cool chance to use the technology to say, you know, rather than having Matt in, in like a crowded apartment or something, we can actually put him into a place like this, like in the Swiss Alps, that actually really resonates with the ideals of what he's trying to do, this yoga live stream. And so we can put all that together into what you see here and what the audience saw is a completely composited experience. Now, the question is, why do we use green screen? Well, it's pretty simple. We use it because it's more affordable. LED screens are quite a bit more expensive, but they do have their uses as well. But the affordability means that you can buy, as you saw earlier, a $20 green screen from Amazon, or you can have a very proper 30 foot green screen like we have in our studio here. It's really affordable to get started. And it gets to the second point, which is it can be completely scalable. So you can make it a 10 foot green screen or a 100 foot green screen. There's really no um, wrong answer with how big it needs to be, what you're trying to use it for. The last thing is it's really tried and true. I mean, we know that all Hollywood films have been shot in green screen workflows before. We also know that things like the nightly news and the weather and the weather channel have been using green screen workflows for a long time. So why is that important? Well, there's a lot of known workflows. There's a lot of known pipeline for these things. It's been in existence for a very long time. But that gets us to the other half of the equation, which is the fun one, LED. And this is the new popular one. And at the core of LED, we use, again, the same technologies, right? We see a camera. There's a little thing that looks like a can on top. That's our tracker called a Stipe Red Spy. And we do the exact same thing. We have a camera. We have a tracker. We have content. But the big difference here is we have what you've heard about on things like Mandalorian is a volume. So with these volumes, they can be really any different shape or size. Uh, this is one here actually in Atlanta presently. It's about 50 feet wide, 15 feet tall, and about 20 feet deep. But what's special about this volume is the volume is actually a screen. So instead of being in a green screen where it's just a green environment and we have to key that out, 
is we're now actually standing on the screen itself. And so we have things like this, me standing on that virtual stage I just showed you. And when we turn the content off, you see this is where I'm actually standing. But when we actually transfer to the audience, we see the composite experience and the same goes here. So I am in a studio standing on a stage that is a screen and this is what that screen looks like. Now, why this is really special and why this is different is because of a few reasons. One, in camera. So what we see through the lens of the camera is exactly what we get now. We get emissive properties. So the, the really great thing about it is we can actually project light. So now we actually get real reflections and real glare and real light falling onto things. And the third is we don't have to do any post-production, right? With green screen workflows, there doesn't have to be post-production either, but here we're doing a lot less because we actually see the finished product live on set. You know, what do some of these things look like? Well, I'll walk through some of these, but these are some random projects and some various things from TV commercials to film shoots and pieces of different things we've worked on in just even the past few months, um, showing really the power and versatility of the workflow. But I'll actually jump in on this frame right here and show you, you know, here's a couple sitting in a car, they're sitting in a Jeep. And in this Jeep, you can see it's nighttime, um, we have the light falling on them. We have imagery outside of the window. Well, obviously we know <laughs> with where I'm going that this was shot on a virtual stage. And this is what that scene looks like from behind the scenes. So you see, here's what the shot looks like through the lens of the camera on a steady cam. And as he moves around, this really shows the power of this technology. We get the real light, the real reflections. You can kind of see it in the distance on the hood of the car, the hood actually shows the reflection of the actual light in the room. And that's what has really changed the workflow is we now actually feel like we're in the environment. This was a, a fun shoot uh, that just looks really cool. And what you see here is the same thing where the bottle's real, the glasses are real, but obviously what is in the background is not. It is an LED screen. And so not only are we able to dynamically change the content, we get those same properties. We get the light, we get the exposure, we actually feel like we're there. And again, stepping back a few feet, this is what that piece looked like. So you can see here that final mountain frame, you see the camera on a dolly, you see the bottle right there, and you see how we get all of those lighting properties of this screen. So the sky reflects on the bottle, it actually glows through the bottle, you actually see that in the finish, you see the mountains through the glass. Those are things that you can't traditionally do on a green screen that we can now do in an LED space like this. But I'll go a step further is what are these LED screens I'm talking about? Well, this is one example. This is a manufacturer called Infled. And what you see here is a panel. And these screens are made up of many, many panels. And each panel is about 18 inches square. It's typically in metric, 500 by 500 millimeters square. And each one of these is a piece of a screen. So imagine if you took your computer monitor and you broke it up into 500 tiny little squares and then put it back together. That's essentially what we're doing is we build these giant volumes and these giant screens with these different little squares. And we can basically scale these squares pretty infinitely to make screens that are bigger or smaller as we need. So in the case of what I showed you is we can put together about 500 of these squares to make what you see here. So we have all the walls and everything built of these same little panels. And as you can see, we have walls, but we also have a floor. And that's a, a real key piece to these workflows is we can do floors and we can also do ceilings. So sometimes we use one over the other really depending on the context, but the cool thing is that floor is a floor. You can stand on it, you can put a car on it, you can drive on it, you can spill things on it. Um, it acts like a real floor, but the floor is a screen. So we can then put content not only around us, above us, but also underneath us. There's quite a bit that goes into these panels and I usually like to show this is there's a lot of wires, a lot of things. There's a lot of um, technology that is used to push these pixels. So it's not like just plugging into a computer monitor, but it's a bit in the kind of same way, a little bit that and a little bit not. So you can see quite a bit goes into all of this back end to make one of these large screens work. So what I wanted to share was a little bit different page is how did we get here? And I wanted to share that for those that are looking to get into this field and what kind of goes into some of the workflow and how 
We as a studio got through this entire pipeline in the past six, seven years of studying it. I wanted to share a little bit of putting all this together and how it happened. Well, Meptic was founded by two of us, uh, Sarah Leinbaum, and she is a SCAD alumni. I unfortunately am not. And she got her MFA in motion design and used that MFA to start Meptic and focus on projection mapping. So with that, our initial start was doing things like this. So not unlike what XR is, the only difference is we didn't have the live and real-time capacities back you know, even six years ago. So when we started, we did things of this nature where we would use projection, we would project on buildings, and it was a really fun workflow. And what we figured out was two key pieces to it. There's a creative piece of how you create these pipelines of immersive canvases, but also the technology that goes into it to drive it. How do you project onto a building? What are the engines and um, the pixels and everything behind it, whether it's a building, whether it's 80 foot tall cubes, or whether it's the 300 foot front of a building, we really focused on that pipeline of creating and executing the engine behind all of this. But with that, we really wanted to focus on something even more than that, and that, that was the idea of interactivity, right? And we really felt that that was the future, is being able to make things interactive, being able to have people actually interact with the visuals like this, having dancers that can move around, have images that follow them, the lights follow them, the sound follows them, doing really immersive things that were really dynamic. And as we started pursuing these new types of technologies, we really found ourselves coming back to one key thing, which was the idea of real time. And real time is really the crux of all of this workflow. It's really the vehicle to how all of it happens is in just the past five years, we've seen the proliferation of these technologies, the proliferation of the software becoming more and more usable and more and more available. And we really saw the chance to be able to create dynamic things like this, you know, where we're projecting on a moving canvas. And we started learning a lot of the same technologies. So here we're actually using the principles of motion capture technology to project onto a painter's canvas, completely dynamic. So not that far off from extended reality because we still had to create content. We still had an engine and we were still doing this idea of tracking. We've done many things like this, which were digital, multi-touch, and interactive. But again, this seems very different than XR. But what you start finding is the pipelines are really all the same. It's about creating digital experiences live. And so we took this workflow and applied it to everything like this through to things like uh, main stage experiences for YouTube, where the entire stage can be interactive and audio reactive. But obviously, we started thinking, how could this be applied to the film and tech, uh, to the film and video worlds? And we did some early work back in 2016, 17, with trying to integrate it into what we now know as the film world. And so we did some early shoots, actually integrating with things like this, robotic arms, and building this workflow. And back then, there wasn't really a workflow; there were really just pieces of the puzzle. And again, that one puzzle was. We'd already been working in real-time content for about two years at this point. And through our work in real-time content, we said, you know, I bet we could put this into a setting like this, like a music video. And we shot this first piece doing exactly that. We have a 30-foot LED screen, and we have all of this real-time content basically being created. And with that, we ended up with frames that looked like this. So what you see here was really the first video that we shot many years ago. And in this frame, what you see is what you get. So Lauren is standing in front of a 30 foot screen. The content here was actually created in the workflow in the tool notch. And what you see is no color correction, no post-production, no VFX, no green screen. It's exactly what the director saw. And so we're actually able to dynamically change that environment to something like this, where she is in an underwater scene or she's in a scene like this, where she's actually in this very heavenly type of environment, but it's all the same place, it's all the same room. And we really thought, you know, this is really interesting, how could we further apply this? And we took it steps further to apply it, like I said, to doing things like TV commercials, applying it to all sorts of film, cinematic uses, 
But we've even taken a step further, applied it to things like esports, using the same pipeline of Unreal Engine to create visual experiences for esports, to working on much more types of corporate experiences like this one. So we really took the experience in these types of pipelines in working in real time to say, you know, it's not that far different than creating content for a traditional computer screen to then bridge that into a larger experience. So I want to talk a little bit about what is it that we actually learned in all of this workflow. And I want to share some of that of what you have to think about and know in these real time pipelines. But one is real time tools still really aren't creation tools. And that's why I said earlier, we still use Maya, Cinema 4D, because we use those to really still create things. And then what we do in these real-time workflows in Unreal is we then assemble things. So when we're trying to build a scene where we're basically using this, we're trying to build a barrel room, we actually go in and build a lot of these pieces out in Cinema, in Maya, and then we bring them into Unreal where we do all of our lighting, typically materials and texturing, all in that one pass. Um, but it's very much a team effort of putting the tools together. So outside of that, we then need this next piece, which is a game plan. Because we can't really just create, we have to go in with a lot more thought out game plan than we traditionally do in say After Effects or Cinema, where you can just go in and make things. You have those tools. We don't have all those tools at our disposal. So we typically have to go, okay, what is it we're trying to build? So we really have to lay out the big picture of where we're going and figure that piece out. One key thing is that this workflow is so different because it is both very creative and very technical at the exact same time. It really combines so many pieces of so many different workflows, like modeling. 3D modeling is such a key piece of how we actually build the geometry. What are we doing? UVs, that is such a big piece Everything is about UV, UV optimization of how we're actually building the worlds. We have things called pixel maps. So how many pixels we're crunching and rendering, those all have to come into discussion about these worlds because again, we render this all live. Things like visual effects, background and properties come into play because we think about things like lighting. That's a huge piece of these worlds is making them feel believable, making that barrel room feel like a real barrel room. We actually have to apply the thoughts of VFX, photorealism, how to, how to light shade it in those ways. We have to think about that. But at the same time, we have to think about game design and MoGraph, right? We have to think about motion graphics, because sometimes we make things that are very animative, things that have a lot more fluidity that aren't just a mountain scene, for instance. So we have to really be thinking on both wavelengths. We also think about game design. So properties of interactivity, things like level building in games is a key piece of this workflow and how it goes together. And then again, like I said, these foundational things that were built on is AR, VR. So awareness of how those technologies play in this entire pipeline goes hand in hand. And I should also say it's really even an extension because now we use VR quite a bit for pre-visualization. So we can actually build an environment, put it in VR and put somebody in that environment before they actually get there. So again, there's a vast amount of technical things and creative things that all go hand in hand to these workflows. And they're things that we have to constantly be thinking about. And yes, you can be better at some and better at others, but fundamentally it's about sharing all of it. And they all go together to make this entire experience. And it's with that, that it's a holistic conversation, right? Because what I said a minute ago is creative, goes together with technical and you have to be thinking about those things together because being especially on set, you have to think about how all the different pieces go together. And those are things that we have to think about at a foundational level when we start projects is what are all the pieces? What are we trying to achieve? What's the end result? What do we want it to look like? We have to think very big picture about everything coming together. Another key piece is what I said earlier, lighting is everything. And there's actually two forms of lighting is one, there's the virtual world, right? So we actually have to light this barrel room and have shadows and lights coming through the windows. And we do that, but we also have to light the actual physical things as well. And so you can see the person's hand here has that same glare of light coming from generally the same direction. And you can see in this picture, again, there's a light 
on a C stand pointing right behind the bottle. And that is very intentional. And when we build these scenes, what we actually really do is talk through what are we trying to achieve with lighting virtually? And then we actually match that physically. So in this case, you see there's a very big backlight that's coming from behind, and we're trying to match that into the virtual experience as well. So we have to think about the physical world implications against the virtual. And the simple answer is we try to keep them the same as much as possible. The last key piece I'll say is this, is that optimization is key. And if you come from a world of game design, this is something you might already know, is how clean our geometry is, how optimized our UVs are, how few polygons we have. These are all things that are at the forefront of our mind all the time. Things like you see here use ray tracing. Well, that is something we still really can't achieve at large scale live is the ability to use ray tracing. So what we have to do is find ways to optimize like what you see here by using baked lighting or baked textures. We have to do that because we don't have all of the technology and all the power to do this entirely live and on the fly. But with that, I'm going to leave you with a few key points here about what's next. And I think it comes down to a few areas pretty simply. Well, one, this technology is only going to allow for deeper and better experiences. We're basically starting with a blank canvas of what is completely possible to make these new experiences. And I think it's only going to go up completely from here in regards to what is actually possible. I think the second thing is lower cost. That is going to be a huge one, right? One of the things I didn't mention is that LED panels are still very expensive. And that technology, I will say, is much more affordable than it was 15, 20 years ago. It's getting better, but I think it will only accelerate from here as this becomes more and more mainstream. More people will be able to use these tools and they will become more adaptable in the things that we're doing. One of the key things I didn't really touch on is better quality. So the idea of photorealism, that will become more and more um, ingrained with the work we're doing. Things like ray tracing will eventually happen live on the fly. But the real thing right now is that there are limits to how far we can push the visual quality of these workflows live and on the fly. And the last thing is it's going to become mainstream. And the way I explain this analogy is like this is we are just at the tip of this iceberg right now. And if you really think back in history to the, the invention of the light bulb, the, the telephone, the plane, the car, these things were all very foreign and very new types of technologies early on. But now they're part of our daily life. And this is where this technology is going. Extended reality, virtual reality, AR, we are just above the water in a journey that is going to go on ahead of us. And there is so much potential for where it can go. But in 15 years and in generations from now, these tools won't just be a cool thing we've seen on a TV show. They will be part of everyday life. We won't see green screens again in 50 years from now because LED will be so proliferated into the things we're doing. I think the other thing is the tools are going to get incredibly better. For, for those who've been following the advances in things like Unreal Engine 5 that's coming out soon, the visual quality is getting there. It's just looking incredible to what's possible. We're seeing things like this that have never been possible before, never were possible 10 years ago, now will be reality in this world. We're seeing it ingrained more and more in our daily lives, and I think that's one of the really cool things. Unreal just released in conjunction with Audi this virtual car configurator where you can actually look at a car like this and decide all the different parameters and settings and things you want to potentially purchase all using Unreal Engine. You're going to see these types of crossovers more and more as we move forward. Is these experiences that are in XR on a film set are going to bridge in with the same tools into daily life on something like this, or even something like this, where GM is actually going to be integrating Unreal Engine into the dashboards of their future cars. So it's pretty crazy to think about that just a few years ago, something that was really purely creating video games is now going to be integrated into the dashboard of our future vehicles. And it's what I said earlier is that these pipelines are not all that different is what gets us from 
building an immersive experience like this or a TV spot like this or a video game, these are all the same pipelines that are getting us there. And they're all the pipelines to be ready for in the future. And so I leave you with this, which is one key quote that's really driven my career and a favorite is, creativity thinks up new things and innovation does new things. And I think that is it, is at the crux of it, it's about doing, it's about trying. And with these tools, there's never been a better time to just jump in. That's the best thing about Unreal is it's free. You can jump in and you can start learning, you can start trying, and you can start hacking these things together. And it's the same place we started five years ago, is we got these tools, brought them into our office and thought, you know, what could we do with this? And there's no better time to do this. You know, we can do this on a home level, personal level, but we can do this at scale. And what I can tell you is these jobs are coming, the workflow is coming. People like Amazon, people like Netflix are building facilities for this type of technology right now. And again, there's no better place to start than just doing. And that is the thing I challenge everyone with is pick up the tools, start learning. There's incredible resources like groups on Facebook, tons of tutorials on YouTube, even we scour through quite a bit of them, but there's incredible resources and with that, I tell you all, please reach out to us. You're more than welcome to reach out on any of our social to Meptic. You can reach us at our email. And actually, we're looking for plenty of people that want to jump into this workflow. Whether you want to be in Unreal and environmental building or in the technology, check out our careers page because we are, we are jumping in. So with all of that, I want to say thank you to all of you. Thank you to SCAD for having me uh, discuss the exciting future ahead of us. Thank you, Nick. Uh, that was one of the most comprehensive and uh, really great breakdown of XR workflows that I think I've ever heard, um, especially for in a, in a layman's way that I can understand, <laughs> uh, and maybe a lot of our students. I know we're going to move into the Q and A portion here, um, oh. and we have a few students on camera that we want to get to right away, sure. and we'll just keep the conversation going there. Um, so our first question is from Alexis Harrington. Are you there, Alexis? Let's see. Da, 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 da. Okay. There you are. I'm Alexis Harrington. I'm a fourth year ITTM major. This is my final quarter. Uh, my question is, how durable are XR stage screens? I imagine they're able to take a decent amount of punishment if you're having <laughs> actors romp all around them and singers dance on them. But exactly how much punishment can they take? Like. What's yeah. the limit? Definitely. Yeah, that's a great question. How durable are these LED visual displays? Very is the answer. Is I mean, again, this technology has been around already for about 20 years. So there's been a lot of iterations of them. As I mentioned, things like LED floors are actually very, very durable. We have done shoots where we've actually had two full-size cars on top of them. You can spill drinks and water on them and they're very durable. That being said, they do have to be taken with care. You know, things can break, but as a whole, they really are just incredibly durable to things like that, having a car on top of them, et cetera. Um, so really pretty durable. Excellent. Um, thank you, Alexis. Um, next student we have on camera again is Joe Salerno. Are you there, Joe? Yes, I am. Hi, how are you? Uh, first off, Fascinating presentation. Thank you so much for that. Really informative. Thank you. Um, me and Alexis were talking in the chat about Unreal Engine 5 and its upcoming release. And with new technology, new engines come new bugs, new problems. So mm -hmm. I was wondering, will you be jumping on uh, the Unreal Engine 5 train as it leaves the station or and dealing with the potential outcomes or sticking with Unreal 4 and the software you're currently using in terms of when you change your workflow? Definitely. So the the real question of how bleeding edge do you live? And the answer is both. You have to always be aware of the tools ahead and the path that's ahead of you. So a lot of times we do spend some side time tinkering or playing with it. But what I will also say is this, is I mentioned there's that key piece, the engine, how we actually run the content. And a lot of those tools actually take time to catch up on what versions of say Unreal that they support. So right now, like the current edge version of Unreal is 4.2.6. We actually just moved to 4.2.6 
I would say in the last month and it's been out for what, six or nine months now, I would say. Mm -hmm. So we typically operate, I would say six plus months behind what is actually happening. We try to spend time vetting the new tools out, seeing what possibilities they offer us. But to your point, we do have to weed out the bugs because you can't have it crash in the middle of a shoot. So we have to be cognizant of those things as well. But I would say we operate about six to nine months behind bleeding edge. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Definitely. you, Joe. Uh, really good question there. Um, so we've got a few people asking questions in uh, our chat window. And I'll just throw those at you, Nick. Um, sure. So several students are wondering, uh, they're curious about Notch. Um, sure. Can you elaborate a little bit on its uses and where it fits into the virtual production? Yeah. So if we compare really the two big ones for us, Notch versus Unreal and what the pros and cons are, Unreal is, is very powerful and it's very popular right now. And what Unreal is very good at is the, the air of photorealism and expansive environment building. So it has a lot of tools for building things like we've seen in video games, levels, these big spaces. Where it lacks is some of those creation tools. It's not as nimble. It's not as quick like things like a Cinema 4D. And for that, we really go to Notch because with Notch, it's really a hybrid between, I would say, like, after Effects Cinema and an Unreal is we can really do a bit of both. So we can do things that are a little more creative. We can get in and just kind of start building things a little bit easier. The other thing that Notch really excels at is things like interactivity. So if we wanna create a virtual environment that has say audio reactivity, that's actually really easy in Notch. It's not impossible in Unreal, but Notch has so many better tools for doing things that are touch interactive data visualization based. So really, again, for us, it goes back to the scenario where, you know, are we trying to build a massive photorealistic environment or are we trying to build something that might be more interactive? And what I will tell you is this, is we're doing shoots in the next six weeks where we actually use both at the same time. So we might actually build the backplate, the background in Unreal because we can build a really expansive virtual environment, but some of the interactive elements that happen around the speaker we can actually build those in Notch. So again, it goes back to using the pros and strengths to each one. Great. Um, gosh, so many questions. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's it's a lot to wrap your mind around, um, yeah. and so much potential. We have one time for one more question here, sure. um, also from Alexis, who was just um, on. Um, but this will I will read the question here. Uh, do you think XR stages have potential for use in theater? Oh, definitely. I, I think where this goes is infinite. You know, we, we've seen film and television, I think, was one of the early adopters to replacing the green screen. But we're seeing everything. We're currently working on immersive fitness right now. So over the next couple months, actually doing immersive workouts, we're actually seeing all sorts of corporate use cases. So meetings, training, um, earnings reports, all sorts of things, but definitely the answer is yes. I think things like theater, all sorts of things we haven't seen before are completely possible because XR allows you to bridge that gap between reality and not reality. And I think that's the thing we challenge a lot of our clients with is, is living on that line and teetering of you can do things that are real. You know, we can put people in the Swiss Alps, but we can also bridge that reality where we can actually use the technology in favor of telling a better story like you've seen with things like Billie Eilish, where you can be in outer space trying to tell a point. I think that's a key point of theater is being able to transform the entire environment. I think you'll definitely see it in the years to come. I actually got a chance to see the Billie Eilish concert in Atlanta yeah. uh, before COVID <laughs> and it nice. was amazing and huge LED screens. Yeah. And I also got a chance to see Mean Girls uh, on Broadway, yeah. which also did the same thing, uh, but not not quite, you know, to the level that we're talking about with interactivity. And it yeah. is it is something that is going to really be amazing uh, when it does all yeah. work and people can take advantage of it. Definitely. Um, very exciting um, what you guys are doing and uh, how our students uh, potentially can be moving in these directions um, and thinking about careers. Um, and I encourage everyone to reach out to the uh, MEPTIC um, 
the website and uh, channels that Nick provided. So uh, please do that. Definitely. And it, that being said, I think we have to call it here, Nick. Um, thank you so much for your time. And uh, once again, a, an amazing presentation and one of, one of the best comprehensive breakdowns I've heard um, uh, on this workflow and extended reality uh, pipeline that we're talking about. So thank you so much for being here today. And Definitely. I will move on to say that is a wrap on SCAD Gaming Fest. Uh, this is it, the last panel for today. From mixed reality and participatory storytelling to artificial intelligence and virtual production over the last two days, we've had we've taken you on uh, to the leading edge of game design and development um, and this new frontier uh, that is quite amazing. Um, we'd love to hear from you though uh, about additional SCAD programming you'd like to see and anything on your mind that you wanna share. Contact us at scadfilm at scad.edu with your ideas. Uh, and we hope you enjoyed the festival and we look forward to seeing you at upcoming SCAD events. Take care, everyone. Thanks again, Nick.